Where the fuck is it? Where the hell is it? I'm sorry, this is- this stream is very scuffed. This stream is scuffed solely because my mom- My mom had me to the 11th hour helping her clean stuff. And I kept telling her mom, I have to stream in like 10 minutes. I have to stream in 8 minutes. Um, but she wouldn't let me get ready. So I just had to s rapid fire set everything up. And usually I don't have to set that much up. But I had to this time because we're doing something new. We're doing something I like to call weird Wikipedia. Basically, you know those people on YouTube who read and react to Reddit posts? Hello, an unknown Minecraft YouTuber fan. Um, those people. Well, this is basically that, but Wikipedia. I love Wikipedia. I love trivia. I love fun facts. I just love... I love this free source of internet. And there's a lot of weird things that have gone on in the past. Hello, Aurora01 Boreal. So I thought, you know what? It would be nice. We just look at some of Wikipedia's weirdest articles. And I... Well, welcome. <laughs> okay, so let's get started. We're going to start off... Okay, if you look here, you will see I have a lot. We're probably not going to get to them all, but I wanted to start us off with some lists. First of all is list. I haven't looked at these. I've looked at, I've, I've looked at quick overviews of what they are to make sure that it's like appropriate for Twitch, but that's it. So you will be just like, okay, this is your second stream. Okay, well, welcome. This is just the s fuck. I lost my train of thought. God damn it! <gasps> I've looked at overviews just so I know it's appropriate for Twitch, but I'm going to be reacting raw. I'm going to be reciting this stuff. So first off, we're going to start with some lists. We got the list of animals awarded human credentials. I, I re it was redirected from list of animals with fraudulent diplomas, so <laughs> you can see why I clicked it. <clears throat> This is going to be interesting because I slur my words and I tend to talk pretty fast. So, got to take some water. <sighs> Pray for me, y'all. This list of animals with fraudulent diplomas includes non-human animals who have been submitted as applicants to suspected diploma mills. Diploma mills, a company or organization that claims to be a higher education institute, but provides illegitimate academic degrees and diplomas for free. The degrees can be fabricated, made up, falsified, fake, or misrepresented. Okay, so all these all these creatures, they have fake diplomas. I thought it was fraudulent diplomas in the sense that they haven't earned them. But no, these are just fake-ass diplomas. Oh, God. Who have been submitted as applicants to suspect, suspected diploma mills and have gotten a diploma. On occasion, they have been admitted and granted a degree, as reported in reliable sources. On occasion, accredited institutions may have awarded mock degrees to animals for humorous purposes. E.g. University of New South Wales awarded a dog turret to a dog. Such cases are not included below. God damn, I'm going to have to find that one. Yeah, you guys are chilling in my chat. Okay. They're they're divided by cats and dogs. So let's check out cats. Colby Nolan, MBA. Colby Nolan was a house cat who was awarded an MBA in 2004 by Trinity Southern University, a Dallas-based diploma mill, sparking a fraud lawsuit by the Pennsylvania Attorney General's office. You ever just you want to get your cat an MBA? I don't know what an MBA is. What is an MBA? Master of Business Administration. You want your cat to be a businessman, but the next thing you know, someone's being sued by Pennsylvania. Oh, you can't read the shit? Oh, fuck. Well, damn. Kobe Nolan lived with, an deputy, with a deputy attorney general in looking to expose Trinity Southern University for fraud. Some undercave it... Undercover agents had the then six-year-old feline obtain a bachelor's degree in business administration 
for $299. So this wasn't just someone looking to get their cat into business. This wasn't just some kook. This was like a planned thing. They wanted to bust these guys. So they decided, you know what, Mittens? You're going, you're going into law. No, wait, you're going into business. God, fuck. On the animal's application, the agents claimed the cat had previously taken courses at a community college while working at a fast food restaurant, babysat, and maintained a newspaper route. <laughs> Why is this so funny? In response, the institution informed Colby that due to the job experience listed on his application, he was eligible for an executive MBA, which he could obtain for $100. The transcript submitted by the agents claimed that Kobe had a GPA of five of 3.5. That is one smart cat. <laughs> I think he might be smarter than me. Upon learning that the cat received the degree, Pennsylvania Attorney General Jerry Pappard filed a lawsuit against Trinity Southern University. In the lawsuit, Pappard directed the diploma mill, which had used email spam to sell degrees, to provide restitution to anyone who had ordered a degree from them. <laughs> In December 2004, the Texas Attorney General obtained a temporary restraining order under the De under the Texas Deceptive Trade Practices Act. That's a word. That's a mouthful. Against Trinity Southern and its owners, Craig B. and Alton S. Poe. God, Craig B. That just sounds like a scam artist's name. God, Craig. The court also ordered the school's assets frozen. <clears throat> it wasn't even a school. It was fucking fake. In March 2005, the Poes were... Wait! No, it just took me a second. Craig B. Poe and Alton S. Poe. That's just, they just didn't fuck off on one person's name. These people were probably brothers. The Poes were assessed penalties of over 100,000 by the court and were ordered not to market or promote fraudulent substandard degree programs or to represent their university as being accredited or f affiliated with legitimate universities. It was reported that the Poes were also associated with Wesleyan, we Wesleyan? I can't fucking, International University and Prixo Southern University. Trinity Southern University's website has been offline since 2005. Good for them. Good for them. They are fucking, George! <laughs> I just looked at the next one. George, registered for practice as a hypnotherapist. What? I should have expected it would get weirder, but I did it. Oh my god. Oh fuck. I need to put on my hoodie. I'm wearing my harness, but I need to change my hoodie. Hold up. Head set back on. All right. Back to George. In 2009, George, a cat owned by Chris Jackson, presenter of the BBC show Inside Out North and Northeast and Cumbria. I don't know where the hell that is. Was registered as a hypnotherapist. After his owner created a fake certificate from a non-existing institution and used it to register with three professional organizations, the British Board of Neurolinguistic Programming, the United Fellowship of Hypnotherapists, and the Professional Hypnotherapy Practitioner Association. This guy had credentials. The person who got the cat, the hypnotherapist registration, had credentials. So why the fuck you get your cat a hypnotherapist? Make your cat a hypnotherapist. Oh, the neck. The name is cute. Is cute for the next one. Kitty O'Malley, high school diploma. 
1973, the Lakeland, Florida, of course it's Florida, Lakeland, Florida newspaper, The Ledger, obtained a high school diploma from Washington Academy for Kitty O'Malley, a cat also known as Spanky. <laughs> well, the diploma was deemed insufficient, insufficient to gain Kitty administration to local colleges. The state attorney general's office planned to investigate the situation. This was in 1973, and it doesn't say if they actually did. <laughs> Why is that so funny? Okay. <clears throat> Oliver Greenhale. I don't... I think I mispronounced that. Fuck. <clears throat> On December 10th, 1967, the Times reported that Oliver Greenhale had been accepted as a fellow of the English Association of Estate Agents and Valuers? Hold up. Oliver Greenhale, Fellowship of Estate Valuation Professional Society. What the fuck is that? What the fuck? After a pavement of 11 guineas, his two references were not verified. What the fuck? I don't know what the hell that is. It says... The Guinea was a coin minted in Great Britain between 1663 and 1814 that contained approximately one quarter of an ounce of gold. Okay. Oliver was a cat belonging to Michael Greenhale, a cameraman with Television West and the Television Wales in the West, who was pursuing an investigation of bogus professional associations. Okay, this is another case of the cat being the bait. Okay. Oreo Collins, high school diploma. That actually sounds like it could be a real person. Oreo C. Collins, born around 2007, is a tuxedo cat who gained notoriety when she received a diploma from Jefferson High School Online in 2009. Although her age was misrepresented in order to qualify, the sting was an investiga investigative oper operation by the Better Business Bureau of Central Georgia, headed by Kelvin Collins, Oreo's owner. God, I'm starting to stutter. It's already happening. We're only like 10 minutes in and my, and my stutter's already back. Okay, Zoe D. Katz. Psychotherapist and hypnotherapy certifications. We got another hypnotherapist. What the fuck is it with people getting cats hypnotherapy? Hypnother hypnotherapy assertions. What the fuck? <laughs> Zoe D. Katz. Zoe the cat in German. Okay. Was a house cat owned by psychologist Steve Katie Eichel. Around 2001, Eichel obtained a psychotherapy certification from his, for his cat from the American Psychotherapy Association and several hypo, hypnotherapy hypnotherapy credentials from other organizations. The certification of Zoe has been cited in several books and articles on credit. On credentialing ex scams and has appeared in psychology and forensic curricula. I'm actually studying to be a forensic science, so I might actually have to study more about this cat. <gasps> oh god. Aishal also served as a consultant to the BBC investigation that led to the certification of George the Cat by several UK hypnosis associations. So these two are fucking associated. Okay, wow. George and Zoe, they know each other. They're they they're tight. They they both work in hypnotherapy. <laughs> My chat is just keeps mentioning George not found. <laughs> His name is George the cat, not George not found. This one was found. It's a cat. Okay, that was it for cats. Now there's dogs. First off is Chester Lund Lundlow, MBA, and t cat not found. Wow, you're funny. <laughs> in 2009, Chester Lundlow, a pug from Vermont, was awarded an MBA by Rocheville University. His owner submitted an application and $499 and received a diploma, two sets of transcripts, a certification of distinction in finance, and a certificate of membership in the student council. So this dog just didn't wasn't wasn't just a businessman. Oh, I just got a new follower. Thank you, One Lonely Go Seven. Okay, this cat was. This is a dog. Why did I say cat? This, this dog was not just a businessman. This guy was on the student council. This was a pug on the student council. He got his degree. He earned it. He served on the student council, ignoring the fact that these are all fraudulent diplomas. <laughs> Lulu, college diploma. In 2010, Mark Howard, 
a member of the legal team for the Clamet? What the fuck is BBC B Sky B? Sky UK Limited is a British broadcaster and telecommunications company. Okay, fuck that. And B Sky B LTD and Anor V Enterprise Services UK LTD and Anor 2010. That was just. I didn't process a single word of that. Whatever. Obtained a degree for his dog Lulu from Concordia College in the U.S. Virginia, Virgin Islands. Lulu graduated with higher marks than the defendant's key witness. <laughs> who the judge found had lied that he attended classes for his Concordia MBA. <laughs> in the legal community, the story of the witness's MD MBA is described as infamous and a super supervisory management cautionary tale the, the fucking fake the dog had had higher marks than the defendant what oh my god what the fuck oh god oh that's funny I need to take a tip oh fuck <clears throat> Okay, this one is from Maxwell Sniffingwell. I don't know how the fuck to pronounce that. Theurgianology slash animal reproduction degree? In 2009, Dr. Ben Mays... Imagine losing your job to a dog. <laughs> Thank you, chat. In 2009, Dr. Ben Mays, a veterinarian in Clinton, Arkansas, obtained a degree in theurgianology animal reproduction from Belford University... On behalf of an English bulldog named Max Sniffingwell, the application included his work as a re reproductive specialist, noting his natural ability in theory of genealogy. What the fuck is that? A branch of animal science concerned with reproduction. Okay. All right. An experimental work with felines and his understanding of the merits of specialization, despite a desire to do them all. He obtained a diploma and transcript and letter of recommendation on res upon recipient of a payment of $549 to the university, but declined an offer to be made an honors graduate for an additional $75. This one wasn't a sting operation. Most of them have been sting operations. This one was just a guy, I think. I think this, I, this is me going off on a limb, but maybe the story here was that the dog kept humping its humping stuff so the owner was just like you know what you're so good at this you deserve a degree because <laughs> that's what all i can understand by these rules by these thing do them all <gasps> oh my fucking god imagine you're so fucking horny that you fucking get a diploma for it <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> ah. Okay. <clears throat> Molly, high school diploma. In February 2012, in a story in a lo on local diploma mills by Houston television station KHOW, dog went to school to have sex. Thank you, chat. <laughs> the reporters got a high school diploma and official transcripts from Lincoln Academy for their photographer's basset hound, Molly. Oh, fuck. <clears throat> Gas. For their photographer's basset hound, Molly, for $300 after filling out a laughable, easy take-home test. According to a homeschooling advocate, Lincoln Academy and other schools were improperly taking advantage of a Texas law that prohibits discrimination by public colleges and universities against homeschooled students. Ollie, associate editor of medical journals. My dog's name is actually Ollie. So, in 2017, Mike Dabe, a public health ep expert in Western Australia, reinvented his dog Ollie as Dr. Olivia Dahl. He made up credentials, including past association of the Shenton Park Institute for Canine Refuge Studies, where she was a rescue dog, <laughs> and submitted her application for posts on the editorial board of some predatory medical journals. Several accepted her application in the Global Journal of Addiction and Rehabilitation Medicine, named her seen, named her associate editor. 
this I'm not sure if this was a sting operation either. It's just weird. <laughs> All right. We got another business dog, Pete MBA. The American University of London offered Pete a four year old male short hair lurcher. I don't know what lurchers look like. What are lurchers? Hold up. It's blank. Fucking course. In Battersea Dogs and Cats Home, London. An MBA. Uh, let's restart. The American University of London. Why is it American University of London? Hold up. London's a fucking you. Uh, it's got its own. Why is it American University of London? London's whole thing is that it's in the UK. It's the capital. The American University of London offered Pete, a four-year-old male short-haired lurcher in Battersea Dog and Cat's Home in London, an MBA for four thousand and five hundred pounds without requiring any coursework. The BBC Current Affairs program Newsnight reported in 2013 that the dog named Peter Smith on the faked CV for a management consulate was offered at BA by the university's accreditation of previous experimental learning board based on his makeup work experience and fictitious undergraduate degree just four days after applying for the course. What the fuck? This one I feel like for some reason is just the one that makes the least sense. I don't know why. I think it's because there's so many big words and I'm too stupid. Makeup work by like makeup work from fucking I'm about to talk about out of my ass again I don't know what I think it's like late work Sony medical degree in May th the May 30th 2007 episode of the Australian Broadcasting Corporation comedy show The Chasers War on Everything documented host Chris Litterdello applying online and obtaining a medical degree for his dog Sonny from the B diploma mill Ashwood University <clears throat> Sonny's work experience included significant protology experience sniffing other dogs' bums. Okay. So, so it's like fucking butt studies. Protology is like butt studies. Wow. Ashwood University has since been listened, listed as a non-accredited degree supplier in the state of Michigan, Oregon, and Texas. Wally, associate's degree. I think this is one of the longest ones. In 2004, the Albany, New York television station, WRBG, ran a report. My mom just came in to tell me she's going to the gym, completely ignoring that I'm streaming. How fucking rude. In 2004, the Albany, New York television station, WRGB, ran a report in which Peter Brancato applied to and received an associate degree from Almeida University on behalf of his dog, Wally. On the application, Brancato listed plays with the kids every day, teaches them to interact better with each other, teaches them responsibilities, like feeding the dog. Almeida University granted Wally a Life Experience Association degree in childhood development. After the report aired, Almeida University protested that Brancato perjured himself by creating a false identity using a fabricated name and date of birth. In a public statement, the Almeida University representative wrote, he completed an application that included a background of the following, eight years tutoring pre-K children, curriculum design and development, teaching coping skills, and volunteer coaching. In March 2008, Wally was featured in the Lake Geneva, Wisconsin mayoral campaign political cartoon with a dialogue bubble reading, I graduated with Bill Chesson, referring to candidate Chesson's Almeida University bachelor's degree. Well, that's all for this list. We got some see also's. A cat whose name in scientific papers were published. List of scholarly publishing things. List of unaccredited institutions of higher education. Non-human electoral candidates. And who's who scam. God, this is like a, why it's so easy to fall into the hole of Wikipedia. I really want to check this out, but I have a bunch of other ones. So I think we're going to have to save that for next time. If this does well, I'm going to probably do another one of these streams because I enjoy it. Uh, this is a list of common misconceptions. Nah. Just going to put that over there. Rather than that. Here. Here's one. Warning for death. This is a list of inventors killed by their own inventions. 
This is a list of inventors whose deaths were in some manner caused by or related to a product, process, or procedure, or other in innovation that they invented or designed. Yeah, this is a list. I've been going... The previous one was the list of animals with awarded human credentials. I thought we should get the list out of the way first, and then we'll do independent ones, so... So let's get started. This is the list of inventors killed by their own inventions. I'm trying to do a sexy voice. I cannot. <clears throat> Under art, Luis Jimenez died 2006. He was 65. He was killed while creating the famous Colorado statue of a blue horse, the Blue Mustang, when a section of it fell on him and severed an artery in his leg. Oh, fuck. Let's see what this horse looks like. Oh, that is beautiful. This thing is 32 feet tall. And that killed a man. Oh, wow. Automotive. Sylvester H. Roper. From 18... The horse with the realistic butt. Okay. Sylvester H. Roper. 1823 to 1896. Inventor of the eponymous steam-powered bicycle, died of a heart of a heart attack or subsequent crash during a public speed trial in 1896. It is unknown whether the crash caused the heart attack or the heart attack caused the crash. Now my chat is just discussing horse ass. Great. <laughs> William Nelson, um, 1879 to 1903. A General Electric employee invented a new way to motorize bicycles. He then fell off his prototype bike during a test run. <laughs> this one's kind of a... These lists are kind of shorter, but that's okay because I'm really excited for what we have next after this article. Francis Edgar Stanley, 1949 to... Eight, no, it's 1849 to 1918 was killed while driving a Stanley Steamer automobile. He drove his car into a wood pile while attempting to avoid farm, rag farm wagons traveling side by side on the road. So this is the guy who invented the Stanley Steamer. Huh. Like. Yeah, it's a fucking. Yeah, whatever. Fred Dusenberg. So the motors, yeah. Fred Dusenberg, 1876 to 1932 was killed in a high-speed road accident, accident in a Duesenberg automobile. Wow. <laughs> Just like, goddamn. I don't know where I was going with this. I have a, I have a thing of chips I re that are in my closet that I really want to grab. <laughs> my fucking gluttony is just like, go on, take a break from reading. Go get the chips. Um, what kind of name is that? I'm pretty sure it's German. Ismail Ibn Hamal al-Jawari. No, that one I'm pretty sure is Arabic. Died 1003 to 1010. Okay, so that wasn't his lifetime. That was around the time he died. A Kazakh Turkish scholar from Farab attempted to fly using two wooden wings and a rope. He leapt from the roof of a mosque in Nisapur and fell to his death. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> this guy was trying to fly like a bird. Uh, he did not. <laughs> Jean Francois Pelletier de Rosier. I probably butchered that. Was the first known fatality in an air crash when his Rosier balloon crashed on crashed on the fifteenth of June, seventeen eighty five, while he and Pierre Romain attempted to cross the English Channel. So this guy built a balloon. He did very well. And then his balloon crashed. He was good at the flying part. Not so much at the steering part, I think. Odo Lidenthal, 1848 to 1896. Died the day after crashing one of his hang gliders. Franz Reichel, a tailor, fell to his death from the first deck of the Eiffel Power while testing his invention, the coat parachute. It was his first attempt with the parachute, and he had told the authorities he would first test it with a dummy. Did he actually use a dummy? No, there's no man. He. 
of course he was a tailor. He probably used a fucking mannequin. And then he didn't realize, oh, there's a difference in weight between a fucking mannequin and a human being. Oh, why the hell? And then he fucking ate it. Aurel Velshu, I think that's how it's pronounced, 1882 to 1913. Died when a self-constructed airplane, Veltu the II, failed during an attempt to cross the Carpathian Mountains. How far did this guy fucking make it? If he was attempting, he probably... Okay, this guy has my respect. What was the first airplane made? Hold up, let me check my... Let me consult my phone. When did the Wright brothers fly? Because I have to figure this out. When did the Wright brothers fly? Okay. This is like 10 years after the after the first flight by the Wright brothers. So this guy had managed to make his own airplane. He had tried he did fail. He did fail. But he probably but it probably made some preliminary tests. It probably did well in the preliminaries. He just he just flew he he aimed too high, but he did well. Oh, I got an old candy good. <clears throat> Henry Smokilski died 1973, was killed during a test flight of the AV Mitzir, a flying car based on the Ford Pinto and the sole product of the company he founded. I actually contemplated adding the AV Mizcar, Mizar to the list of stuff we would read, but I ultimately decided, nah, save it for another time. Okay, Michael DeCare died 2009, age 53. Like, a lot of these people, though, don't have the ages they died out. Died after a crash that occurred while testing his flying taxi device, designed to permit fast, affordable travel between regional cities. A flying taxi. A jet pod. What? Okay. Adriel Zanilkov, a Soviet scientist, was developed. This one's the chemistry. Okay, we're entering chemistry. I, I should have said that first. We're entering chemistry. Andre Zilin Zieko. I I did it okay first time. I fucking butchered it this time. Whatever. That guy. Andre. I'm just gonna call him Andre because I can pronounce his first name, not his last. A Soviet scientist was developing chemical weapons in 1987 when a hood malfunction exposed him to traces of the nerd agent Noviko Novichok 5. Okay. Spent weeks in a coma, months unable to walk, and years suffering fatal health before dying from its effects in 1992-3. Oh, here's Marie Curie. She was a Polish naturalized French physician and chemist who conducted pioneering research on radioactivity. On July 4th... <clears throat> fuck, I have a... <clears throat> my throat... <clears> throat> probably sound like March when I do that. Fuck. On July 4th, 1934, she, divide, she died at the Salincello Sanatorium in Passy, Haute Sauve from apolastic anemia, believed to have been contracted from her long-term exposure to radiation, some of which was from the devices she created. ABN Arnold von Stocki. Sochocki. Sochocki. I think that's that's what we're going with. Sochocki. Invented the first radium-based luminescent paint, but eventually died in 1928 of aplastic anemia, resulting from his exposure to the radioactive material. Guy made poison paint and fucking died because of it. God damn. Okay, we're, there's only one person in industrial. The person is William Bullock, 1813 to 1867. Invented the web rotary printing press. Several years after its invention, his foot was crushed during the installation of a new machine in Philadelphia. The crushed foot developed gangrene and Bullock died during the amputation. This guy made the printing press. Well, a rotary printing press. He didn't invent the printing press. I'm pretty sure that was something sometime back in with Martin Luther. Um, not Martin Luther King, just regular Martin Luther. And... It fell on his foot. 
Imagine dying of death by stubbed toe. Wait, do you need do you need to cut yourself to get gangrene? I mean, he just crushed his foot. I mean, it still sucks, but that's what I'm comparing it to. I I once got into a We had these foam sticks when I was a kid, and me and my siblings got into a big fight with them, and it was like getting really heated, and I stubbed my toe on something. But I just, but I was high on adrenaline during the fight. Uh, gangrene. Okay, we, I was high on adrenaline during. Oh, that's disgusting. Okay, we're not clicking on that. That is a gross picture. Nope, 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 nope. I'm not trying to violate the terms of service. No, thank you. But we got into a big fight with the pool noodles, and I stubbed my toe. I was high on adrenaline, so I didn't look, and I kept fighting. After the matter, I looked down, and I had, and I was bleeding everywhere. I, I had cut my toe, my the, my toes open, but w stubbing my toe. And then just th at the beginning of this year, I ended up breaking a toe. So I'm not good with my feet. <laughs> okay. Henry Wynn Stanley. I am very sorry about showing you the gangrene, everyone. I'm very sorry. Eight. No, that's 16. 1644 to 1703. Monk guess? Whatever. Built the first lighthouse, first lighthouse on the Eddystone Rocks in Devon, England between 1896 and... Eight, I keep saying 18. It's 1696 and 1696. 98. During the great storm of, 07, of 1703, the lighthouse was completely destroyed with Wynn Stanley and five other men inside. No trace of them was found. Well, shit. <laughs> Next up is John Day. Okay. John Day. Uh, 1740 to 17... 74. Why did that? Why did I have to say that so slowly? English carpenter and wheelwright died in a test experimental driving chamber. Okay. Pretty standard as far as crazy scientists go. Horace Lawson Hunley. 1823 to 1863. Confederate. Oh, fuck him. Confederate inventor. Ground with several other cruel members during it. Test of his invention, the first combat submarine, which was later named the H.L. Hunley. Hmm. Okay. Cowper! This person, the next person's name is Cowper! Why is that funny? Why is that funny to me? Okay. I don't need to. I'm probably gonna have to refill my water soon, damn. Cowper Phelps Culls, 1819 to 1870 was a Royal Navy captain who drowned with approximately 480 others in the sinking HMS Captain, a masted church ship of his own design. Okay. Tom Sanders Jr. Well, we found out how Casper died. That's This isn't Casper. This na guy's name is Cowper. Like, cow. The first three letters of his name are cow. He is literally Cowper Phipps Coles. Okay, this is Thomas Andrews Jr. 1873 to 1912. Was an Irish-born businessman and shipbuilder. He was a managing director ahead of the drafting department on the shipbuilding company Harland and Wolf in Belfast, Ireland. As the naval architect in charge of the plans for the ocean liner RMS Titanic. He was traveling on board that vessel during her maiden voyage when the ship hit an iceberg on the 14th of April, 1912. He perished along with more than 1,500 others. His body was never required. The guy who made the Titanic fucking went down with it. What? <laughs> I feel like this is something they should teach in class. The fact that the fucking... The 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 bill the constructor of it went down with the ship not just like am amongst a bunch of other people he shouldn't have just been a footnote because this guy is the one who designed it i did not know no this guy wasn't the captain this was the architect the one who designed it i'm pretty sure <clears throat> well, that was maritime oh and over here we got the submarine the hl hunley let's see the Huh. 
small. <laughs> Next up is medical. <laughs> oh, hold up. Actually, I gotta refill my water. I and I'm gonna go grab my chips because my fucking gluttony. I need something in my mouth. I need chips. Hold up. Rapid fire. I'm pissed off because my mom said she put my chips in my closet. They aren't in the fucking closet. Where the fuck did she put my chips? Whatever, we're going into medical now. <clears throat> Wet. <clears throat> Alexander Bogdanov, 1873 to 1928, was a Russian physician, philosopher, science fiction writer, and revolutionary of the Belarusian ethnicity. <coughs> Hell yeah, I'm angry. I had fucking snacks. Where'd the snacks go? Fucking, I'm gonna have to go on a snack hunt later because my mom fucking should put my chips somewhere. I had chips. Fucking chip riot. Okay. Belarusian ethnicity who experimented with blood transfusion. Attempting to achieve eternal youth or at least partial rejuvenation. He died after he took the blood of a student suffering from malaria and tuberculosis. Who may have also been the wrong blood type. <laughs> this guy was this guy wanted to be a vampire. This guy was basically a fucking vampire. He was taking blood from others to keep himself to try and attain eternal youth. That's like fucking premium mad science shit. So, wow. <laughs> And he took blood from a student suffering from malaria and tuberculosis. You probably should, like, do a fucking health screening before you take the blood. God. Thomas Mid Midgley Jr. I think the... Midgel... Midgley. Midgley. I fucking... I don't know what I'm doing. Was 1889 to 1914. Was an American engineer and chemist who contracted polio at age 51 leaving him severely disabled. He devised an elaborate system of ropes and pulleys to help others lift him from bed. He became accidentally entangled in the ropes and died of strangulation at the age of 55. However, he is better known for his two of his other inventions, the Taranthelli lead addictive added to gasoline and chlorofluorocarbons. What the fuck? Whatever. Publicity and entertainment. <clears throat> Karel Sochek... Sochek... Fuck. I don't know. 1947 to 1985 was a Czech professional stuntsman living in Canada who developed a shock absorbent barrel. He died following a demonstration involving the barrel being dropped from the roof of the Houston Astrodome. He was fatally injured when his barrel hit the rim of the water tank meant to cushion his fall. So it probably might have actually worked. But it didn't. Railway. Valerian Abakovsky. 1895 to 1921. Construction, the Arrow Wagon. Constructed the Arrow Wagon, an experimental high-speed rail car fitted with an aircraft engine and propeller traction intended to carry it Soviet officials. On, on the 24th of July, 1921, it derailed at a high speed, killing six of the 22 on board, including Abovsky. <laughs> it shouldn't surprise me that this was Soviet. I don't know why. It shouldn't. <laughs> uh, Rocketeery. Max Valier, 1895 to 1930, invented liquid-fueled rocket engines as a member of the 1920s German rocket society, Viren für Remschniffhart. I probably butchered that. On the 17th of May, 1930, an alcohol-fueled engine exploded on his test bench in Berlin, killing him instantly. Finally, Mike Hughes, 1950s, 
6 to 2020, was killed when the parachute failed to deploy during a crash landing while piloting his homemade steam-powered rocket. And the, then here's like a bunch of popular legends and related stories. There is Pyrrhus of Athens, circa 50, 550 BCE. According to legend, he was the first to be roasted in a brazen bull. He made for Phalaris of Sicily for executing criminals. <clears throat> Lysi, 208 BCE, prime minister during the, during the Qin Dynasty, was executed by the Five Pains method, method which some sources claim he had devised. However, the history of the Five Pains is traced further back in time than Li Shi. Wen Hu, a possibly, a possibly acrophile 16th century Chinese official said to have attempted to launch himself into outer space in a chair to which 70 to 47 rockets were attached. The rockets exploded, and it is said that neither he nor the chair were ever seen again. <gasps> what? <laughs> oh, I am so glad I read that. Oh my god. How Tordo, I probably butchered that again, a most likely legendary 16th century Portuguese man who jumped from the top of Vesuvius Cathedral wearing a biplane like biplane like flying rig and an eagle shaped helmet. <laughs> William Brody, Deacon Brody of 18th century Edinburgh, is reputed to have been the first victim of a new type of gallows, which he was also of which he was also the designer and builder. But this is doubtful. Okay. There's also for understand also there's also Darwin Awards list of entertainers who died during a performance list of unusual deaths I was honestly really considering doing this one but I decided not to hoisted with his own petard <laughs> okay now we got the next one which is the title for this whole stream and we got some nice music the great stink I don't know much about this. All that I know is that it was London and it was very stinky. I thought this was, it might be related to the bubonic plague, but I could also be very fucking wrong. But considering the fact you got a uh, this picture called the Silent Highwayman, it it says death rose on the this is like the caption death rose on the Thames, claiming the lives of victims who have not paid to have the river cleaned up. Okay. So, assuming they they dumped trash in the river, it flooded, and I and I heard it was like a very hot summer from what the blurb I read. So everything fucking reeked. <laughs> oh, I I pressed the wrong button. Ah. I mean, I probably should have warned this was going to be a scuffed stream because I'm trying something new. As far as I know, no one else has tried this, so. This is very scuffed. <laughs> okay, the Great Stink. The Great Stink was an event in central London on, in July and August 1858, during which the hot weather exuberated the smell of untreated human waste and industrial effluent that was present on the banks of the River Thames. Oh no. Oh no. God. <laughs> All right, brace yourselves. The problem had been mounting for some years with an aging and inadequate sewer system that emptied directly into the Thames. The mismia from the affluent was thought to transmit contagious diseases and three outbreaks of cholera before the Great Stink were blamed on the ongoing problems with the river. Oh no. Oh no, this is going to be disgusting, I feel. The smell and fears of its possible effects prompted action from the local and national administration. administrators who had been considering possible solutions for the problem. The authorities accepted a proposal from the civil engineer Joseph Banzelet to move the affluent eastwards along a series of interconnecting sewers that sloped outwards towards outfalls beyond the metropolitan area. Work on high, mid, and low-level systems for the new... Northern and Southern Outfall Sewers started in the beginning of 18... Ah, fuck, it's a number. 1859. And lasted until 1875. To aid the drainage, pumping stations were placed to lift the sewage from the lower levels to higher pipes. Two of the more ornate stations, Abbey Mills in Stratford and Crossness on the... Er... Earthy... 
Earth Marshes with architectural designs from consultant engineer Charles Driver are listed for protection by the English Heritage. Langton Getz's plan introduced the three embankments to London in which the sewers ran, the Victoria, the Chelsea, and the Albert Embankments. I'm I'm probably keep butchering, butchering words because I slur my words, so so nothing's consistent. Nothing is consistent. Bailingette's words ensured that the sewage was no longer dumped in, onto the shores of the Thames and brought an end to the cholera outbreaks. His actions are thought to have saved more lives than the efforts of any other Victorian official. His sewer system operates into the 21st century, servicing a city that has grown to populate over 8 million. The historian Peter Ackrud argues that Bailingette should be considered a hero of London. Can we just take a moment to salute this guy who fucking single-handedly figured out the problem and stopped this bullshit, quite literally. So thank you, Balzil Getty. I'm probably, here, let's hover over his article. This man. God, that is a fucking epic mustache. Holy shit. Thank you. Fucking if I was a guy, I would probably want a mustache like that. That is awesome. Okay, let's go into the background. Here's satirical impressions of the state of the Danes water in the... Okay. Who the fuck is that? This thing is called Dirty Thought or... Dirty... Ah! Dirty Father Thames. 1848. Filthy river, filthy river, foul from London to the Nore. What art thou but one vast gutter, one tremendous common shore? Oh, this shit came with a poem, I just realized. After I recite the poem! My god! <sighs> background. Brick sewers had been built in London from the 17th century when sections of the Fleet and Walbrook rivers were covered for that purpose. In the century preceding 1856, over 100 sewers were constructed in London. And at that date, the city had around 200,000 cesspits and 360 sewers. Some cesspits leaked methane and other gases, which often caught fire and exploded, leading to loss of life, while many of the sewers were in poor state of repair. During this early 19th century, improvements had been undertaken in the supply of water to Londoners. And by 1858, many of the city's medieval wooden water pipes were being replaced with iron ones. This combined with the introduction of flushing toilets and the rising of the city's population from just under 1 million to 3 million led to more water being flushed into the sewers, along with associated effluent. The outfalls from factories, slaughterhouses, and other industrial activities put further strain on the already failing system. Much of this outflow either overflowed or discharged directly into the Thames. Oh no. So that is like fucking animal carcasses. That is poo. That is so much bad shit going into what I'm pretty sure is the city's water supply. And even if it's not, it ru the Thames, as far as I know, is like a major waterway in London. I've, I've been to London, but I... It was only a few years ago, but why am I... I'm drawing such a blank. So, and they and the, finally, when they decide to fix it, uh, a lot of people are coming in. So, that kind of sucks. All right. The scientist Michael Faraday described the situation in a later letter to the Times in July 1855. Shocked at the state of the Thames, he dropped pieces of white paper into the river to test the degree of opacity. The conclusion was that near the bridges, the, the festulence rolled up in clouds so dense they were visible at the surface, even water of, hit of this kind. The smell was very bad and common to the whole of the water. It was the same as that which now comes up from the gully holes in the streets. The whole river was for the time a real sewer the smell from the weather was from the river was so bad that in 1857 the government poured chalk lime chloride of lime and carbolic acid in the waterway to ease the stench so they fucking what are these chloride of lime oh it's like bleaching powder it's like bleaching agents they they tried to pour bleach into the fucking tried to bleach the river to fucking fix the problem. I bleach doesn't smell that good, so I can only assume it just made it worse. The prevailing thought in Victoria 
see in healthcare concerning the transmission of contagious diseases was the mismia theory, which held that most communicable diseases were caused by the inhalation of contaminated air. This contamination could take the form of the odor of rotting coat corpses or sewage, but also rotting vegetation or the exhaled breath of someone already diseased. Yeah, they're not that far off. Exhaled breath of someone already diseased, yeah. Nismia was believed by most to be the vector of transmission of cholera, which was on the rise in 19th century Europe. The disease was deeply feared by all because of the spread, because of the speed at which it could spread and its high fatality rates, cholera. Oh. Let's just not look at that. <sighs> One first major cholera epidemic stuck, struck in 1831 when the disease claimed 6,536 victims. In 1848 to 49, there was a second outbreak in which 14,000 137 London residents died. And this was followed by a further outbreak in 1853 to 1854 in which 10,738 people died. During the second outbreak, John Snow, a London-based physician, noticed that the rates of deaths were higher in those areas supplied by the Lambethian and the Southwark and Baxel Water Companies. I assume those water companies took from the Thames. In 1849, he published a paper on the mode of communication of cholera, which posited the theory of the waterborne transmission of disease rather than the Mismia theory. Little attention was paid to the paper. Following the third cholera outbreak in 1854, Snow published an update to his trance after he focused on the effects in Broad Street, Soho. Snow had removed the handle from the local water pump, thus preventing access to the contaminated water, which resulted in a fall in death. It's later established that the leaking sewer ran near the well from which the water was drawn. Oh no. <laughs> these people were drinking poo water. All oh, these poor souls, they were drinking poo water. This is just, you got so much bad shit. You got these poor people drinking fucking duty water I'm just eating candy all this duty water talk cannot stop my love of candy okay local government <clears throat> the civic infrastructure overseeing the management of London sewers has gone through several changes in the 19th century in 1848 the Metropolitan Commission of Sewers MCS was established at the urging of the societal reformer Edwin Chadwick and a royal commission. F to poo drinking people. Thank you, chat. The commission superseded seven of the eight authorities that have managed London sewers since the time of Henry VIII. It was the first time that a unitary power had full control of the city's over the capital's sanitation function facilities. The Building Act 1844 had ensured that all new buildings had to be connected to a sewer, not a cesspool, and the commission set about connecting cesspools to sewers, or removing them altogether. Because of the fear that the mismia from the sewers would cause the spread of disease, Chadwick and his sister, the pathologist John Simmons, ensured that the sewers were regularly flushed through, a policy that resulted in more sewage being discharged to the Thames. Oh no, they tried, they tried to help, but they just made it worse. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no! I have to. I just stuffed my mouth with more candy. I'm a candy chipmunk and I fucking love it. In August 1849, the MS, MCS appointed Joseph Belzaghetti. Bel Belzaget. I keep pronouncing his name weird! I don't think I've ever pronounced it consistently. Goddamn! Basil get to the position of assistant surveyor. He had been working as a consult engineer in the railway industry until overwork had brought about a serious breakdown in his health. His appointment to the commission was his first position on his return to employment. Working under the chief engineer, Frank Foster, he began to develop a more systematic plan for the city sewers. The stress of his positions was too much for Foster, and he died in 1852. Oh, no. 
I burped. That actually was perfectly timed. Okay. 1852, Basil Getty was promoted to, into his position and continued redefine, refining and developing the plans for the development of the sewage system. The, Metropoli the Metropolis Management Act of 1855 replaced the commission with the Metropolitan Board of Works, MBW, which took control of the sewers. By June... 1856, Basil Getty. Oh, Tommy and his life. Let's be honest. Do you guys even care about the fucking this gov the government? Do you care about the Great Stink? I. This is the government shit. We're reading the government shit, and I personally, this is the boring part of it. Fucking. I just want to know what the fuck. Should we just skip to Legacy? Because, sure, there was a good shit. But I think the good shit was all pretty much described in the beginning. I want to read the Legacy. So I am using my executive power to say, as much as I love you, Wikipedia, I don't want to read that part. We're skipping to Legacy. In 1866, there was a further cholera outbreak in London that claimed... In fairness, Aurora, I don't even know Twitch etiquette. I'm relatively new. In 1866, there was a further cholera outbreak in London that claimed 5,596 lives, although it was confined to an area of the East End between Adgate, Algate and Bow. At the time, that was part of London, which had not been connected to Basilgate's system. And 93% of the fatalities occurred within the area. The fault lay with the East London Water Company, who discharged their sewer ha sewage half a mile downstream from their reservoir. The sewage was being carried upstream into the reservoir on the oncoming tide, contaminating the area's drinking water. The outbreak and the diagnosis of, of its cause led to the acceptance that cholera was waterborne, not transmitted by masmia. The Lancet related details of the investigation to, uh, into the incident by Dr. William Farr stated that his report will render irresistible the conclusions at which he has arrived in regard to the influence of the water supply in, the, in causation of the epidemic. It was the last outbreak of the disease in the capital. God, why is my tongue hurting? The fuck? Weird. In 1878, a Thames pleasure steamer, the SS Princess Alice... Collided with the colour Brywall Castle and sank, causing over 650 deaths. The incident took place close to outfalls and questions were raised in the British press over whether the stewage was responsible for some of the deaths. In the 1880s, further fears over possible health concerns because of the outfalls led to the MBW purifying sewage at Crossness in Beckton, rather than dumping the untreated waste into the river. And a series of six sludge boats were ordered to ship affluent to the North Sea for dumping. The first boat commissioned in 1887 was named the SS Bezelget. The procedure remained in service until December 1998 when the dumping stopped and, the, and an incinerator was used to dispose of the waste. The sewers were expanded in the late 19th century and again in the early 20th century. The drainage network as of 2015 managed by Thomas Thames Water and is, is managed by Thames Water. It's not a person's name. It's a fucking company. God damn it me. And it's used, <clears throat> and it's used by up to eight million people a day. The company said in 2014 that the system is struggling to cope with the commands of 21st century London. Crossness pumping station remained in its use until the mid 1950s when it was replaced. The engines were too large to remove and left in situ. Although they fell into a state of disrepair, the, de the station itself became a Grade One listed building with the Ministry of Public Buildings and Works in June. 1970s, since replaced by English Heritage. <clears throat> the building and its engines are, as of 2015, under restoration by the Crossness Engines Trust. The president of the trust is the British television producer Peter Basil Getty, the great great grandson of Joseph. Oh, they're keeping it in the business, they're keeping it in the family. <clears throat> As of 2015, part of the Abbey Mill facility continues to operate as a sewage pumping station. The building's large double chimneys were removed during the Second World War, following fears they could be used as Luftwaffe, as landmarks for navigation. And the building became a Grade Two listed building with the Ministry of Works in in November 1974. I am 
I, I swear, I, I have glasses, but I'm nearsighted. I'm not farsighted. I don't need them for this shit. So why am I fucking up? Why am I fucking up? Ah! The provision of an integrated and fully functional sewer system for the capital, together with the associated drop in cholera cases, led the historian John Doxett to say that Basil Gett probably did more good and saved more lives than any single Victorian official. Basil Getty continued to work at the MBW until 1889, during which time he replaced three of, London bridge, three of London's bridges, Putney in 1886, Hammersmith in 1887, and Battersea in 1890. He was appointed president of the Institution of Civil Engineers in 1884 and in... Eight, in and in 1901, a monument commemorating his life was opened in the on the Victorian embankment. When he died in March 19, 1891, his obituaries, the Illustrated London News, wrote that Basil gets appointed president. Two great titles. The obituaries for the Times opined that the two great titles to fame are that he beautified London and drained it. While Sir John Cood, the president of ICE at the Times, said that Basil gets work will ever will ever remain as minus to skill and professional ability the obituaries for the times opine no fuck Ugh! the obituaries i i keep fucking up i i keep losing my spot goddamn let's try this all again when he died in march 1891 the obituaries the london news wrote that basil get that Basil gets two great titles to fame are that he beautified London and drained it. While Sir John Cood, the president of ICE at the time, said that Baguette, Basil Gett's work will ever remain as minus to his skill and professional ability. The obituaries for the Times opined that when the New Zealander comes to London a thousand years hence, the magnificent solidity and the flawless system symmetry of the great granite blocks which form the wall of the Thames embankment will still remain. He continued, the great sewer that runs beneath Londoners has added some 20 years to their chance of life. The historian Peter Akrod, in his history of subterranean and London, London, considers that with John Nash and Christopher Wren, Basil Gett enters the pantheon of London heroes because of his work, particularly the building of, Vic of the Victoria and Albert embankments. Fuck! Ah! Why did I struggle so much with that? What the fuck? Fuck. Why did I struggle so much? <clears throat> so we really skipped a lot of that. Holy shit. I skipped a large fucking portion. I'm not proud of myself for it, but God, my throat. I want to try and get two more articles out of the way. I want to try and do five articles per stream. I've been talking a lot, but I'm a blabbermouth. And we've only been at it for like an hour, so... Okay, which one, which one, which one? I will go with you. Introducing, uh, introducing everyone, potato! <laughs> Apparently this was a racehorse with an absolutely ridiculous name, so I felt like we should read about, read a bit about this guy. And I just looked down and I realized how many fucking numbers there are. Oh God, pray for me. Oh god, numbers. Oh god. I almost did the sign of the cross. I'm Jewish. God fucking damn it. <laughs> this, this is fear. Okay. Potato or variations of potatoes was an 18th century thoroughbred racehorse who won over 30 races and defeated some of the greatest racehorses of the time. He went on to be a Tsar. He is now best known for the unusual spelling of his name pronounced potatoes. Fuck that. We're calling him Potato. We're calling him that. Okay. Potato. Also spelled pot eight O's. Oh, fucking a bunch of other ways. Was a chestnut colt bred by William B. Birdie, 4th Earl of Abington, in 1773. He was served by the undefeated Eclipse. He was the first foal out of Sports Mistress, who was served by Warren Sportsmaster and traced to Tawats Dunmare from a family number... 38 on her dame's side. I don't know horse breeding. What the fuck does this mean? Ah! 
The origin of his name has several different variations. According to the most common, Abington intended to call the young colt Potato and instructed the stable boy to write the name on the fe on a feed bin. The stable boy spelled the name as Potato, which so amused a it. A, a fail. It was a failed attempt at a spelling phonetically. Okay, God. Which so amused Abington that he adopted the spelling. Subsequent writers have used a variety of spellings that respect the intended revised pronunciation potatoes. In the Jockey Club's online database, equineline.com, the name is spelled as potatoes. The general stud book uses potato. And then you just have a bunch about his racing career and stud career. And then the fucking pedigree. Fuck that. We didn't come here for that. We came here to make fun of this horse's name. Potato! So I think that's like fucking four down. I should really do more lists because I feel like the list you can't really skip much. Well, you probably could, but we're probably actually going to get six because this is what I've been wa looking forward to. This is actually fucking ridiculous. And, it's and it should be expected since it comes from the Danish. Ugh, I'm going to butcher this. I'm going to fucking butcher this. Hande Pruder Rutschbun. Did I do that? I don't know if I did. I and I'm scared to. I'm scared to ask. Hande Pruder Rutschbun is Danish for dog fart roller coaster. Now who the fuck? Whoever the fuck made this? I want to know what drugs you were on and can I have some? Because that name and this whole ride is absolutely fucking ridiculous. Okay, it's a steel family roller coaster at Bon Bon Land in Southern Zealand, Denmark, approximately 100 kilometers from Copenhagen. The roller coaster is known best for its name and its unique dog flatulence related theme. It is an, exa it is an example of flatulence humor. Who, what drugs was the creator on i want to know i want to know this is fucking hundred Buter hutchman was the first coaster to open at bon bon land in eight in 1993 bon bon opened was bon bon land was opened in 1992 by a candy maker that manufactured disgusting sounding candy fingers on candy flavors oh fuck <clears throat> Hundish Spruder dog farts were one of the most popular flavors and consequently became the theme for the first coaster of the ride. Okay, so there is some explanation behind the fucking ridiculous name. Built by Zerier, the coaster layout is a relatively simple family coaster. It is the park's smallest roller coaster. I need a drink. God, I've been I've been I've been doing funny voices and it's fucking my throat, God. Wet! The coaster trains are designed in the shape of a dog named Har Henry Dogfart, and the dog theme is pervasive throughout the coaster's course. Riders go past of a statue of a defecating Henry the dog, through a kennel, past bones and piles of dog feces. There are also speakers throughout the ride, which makes farting sounds. Oh god, now we need to read the reviews. Oh fuck. Hunter Sputerbun's name and theme have attracted considerable attention. The coaster has been listed among the Travel Channel's 15 Wacky Roller Coasters and is included in the Mental Floss article 8 Theme Parks Rides I Wouldn't Wait in Line For. The coaster has also been described by a number of other sources including USA Today, Cracked, and The Chive. The Travel Channel describes Hunter Sputerbun as having the most pure wackiness of any roller coaster. Gadling says the coaster gives a new meaning to the phrase, the wind in my face. What in the actual fuck? I'm holding my f head in my hands because what the fuck? What? <laughs> and now we need to click on the picture. We need to fucking... Can you actually see the turd? I'm gonna need to...
There's even a butt view. I am so sorry I made you watch. Look at that. I need to... We're closing out of that. And next we're going to... I guess we're going to look at this one now. Because we can fit six in since the last two were relatively small. But my god. The shit dog roller coaster. We just witnessed the shit dog roller coaster chat. In the actual fuck. <laughs> what the fuck is that? Okay. Calming myself down. This is the gavel goat. I'm probably butchering that. It's a traditional Christmas display erected annually at Slotsetskorg Castle Square in central gavel, Sweden. It is a giant version of a traditional Swedish Yule goat. Huh. The... The Swedes make goats. Huh. Figure made of straw. It is erected each year by the local community groups at the beginning of Advent over a period of two days. It has been the subject of repeated arson attacks. And despite security measures and the nearby presence of a fire station, the goat has been burned to the ground most years since its first appearance in 1965. That's why we're here. We're here for a burning goat. <laughs> As of December 2019, the goat has been damaged 37 times. Burning the goat is illegal, and a court of appeal stated that the offense should normally carry a three-month prison sentence. As it, is sent as it sentenced a 27-year-old man to suspended sentence and day fines for aggravated property damage in 2018. Since 1986, two Yule goats have been built in Gavel. The Gavel goat by the Southern Merchants and the Yule goat built by the Natural Science Club of the School of Vasa. What? I'm wondering. I have to wonder, what events in my life led to me sitting in my room with back pains, reading Wikipedia for an audience? I probably wouldn't change the course I want, the course I did, but I just gotta wonder what decided this. Alright. <clears throat> the Gavel Goat is erected every year on the first day of Advent, which occurred to Western Christian traditions, boo, is a late is in late November or early December, depending on the calendar year. In 1966, an advertising consultant, Sig Gavilan, <sighs> primes for arson. <laughs> I, I I would like that. Came up with the idea of making a giant version of the traditional Swedish Yule goat and placing it in the square. The design of the first goat was assigned to the then chief of the Gavel Fire Department, Gavilan's brother, George Gilvin. <laughs> We got another George, everyone! I know you fucking weirdos are gonna be happy about that. The construction of the goat was carried out by the fire department, and they erected the goat each year from 1966 to 1970, and from 1986 to 2002. The first goat was financed by Henry Strom. On the 1st of December 1966, the 13 meters. Tall, seven meter long, three ton goat. Holy shit, the thing was three tons. Was erected in the square. On New Year's Eve, the goat was burned down and the perpetrator was found and convicted of vandalism. The goat was insured and Strom got all of his money back. <gasps> Starting from the beginning, these goats were being burnt down. <laughs> what? Oh, wow. And I bit my tongue. God, sh shit. This is fucking ridiculous. Oh, fucking god. A group of businessmen known as the Southern Merchants financed the building of the goats in subsequent years. In 1971, the Southern Merchants stopped building the goats. The Natural Science Club of the School of Vasa began building the structure. Their goat was around 2 meters. Due to the positive reaction their Yugo received that year, they built another one the following year, and from then on, the Southern from then on. The Southern Merchants began building their own goats again in 1986. <clears throat> the cost for the 1966 goat was 10,000 Swedish dollars. I'm just going to say Swedish dollars because I don't know what the fuck Swedes use. 
The price tag for constructing the goat in 2005 was around 100,000 Swedish dollars. The city pays one third of the cost while the southern merchants paint the remaining sum. Since 2003, the construction of the goat has been undertaken by a group of unemployed people known as ALU workers. <clears throat> God, my throat. The display has become notable for being a, recur being a return recurring target for vandalism by arson and has been destroyed many times since the first goat was erected in 1966. Because the fire station is close to the location of the goat, most of the time the fire can be extinguished before the wooden skeleton is severely damaged. <clears throat> if the goat is burnt down before the 13th of December, feast day of St. Lucia, the goat is rebuilt. The skeleton is then treated and repaired, and the goat reconstructed over it using straw with which the goat committee has pre-ordered. As of 2005, four people have been caught or convicted for vandalizing the goat. In 2001, the goat was burned down by a 51-year-old visitor from Cleveland, Ohio, in the United States. He spent 18 days in jail and was subsequently convicted in order to pay 100,000 Swedish dollars in damages. The court confiscated his cigarette lighter with the argument that he clearly was not able to handle it. He stayed in court... He stated in court that he was no goat burner and believed that he was taking part in a completely legal goat burning tradition. After he was released from jail, he returned to the U.S. without paying his fine. <laughs> Imagine going to Sweden for vacation only so you can burn a goat. What the fuck? I say as an American, what the fuck are Americans on? <laughs> What the fuck? What is that? <laughs> in 1996, the Southern Merchants introduced camera surveillance to monitor the goat 24 hours a day. On the 27th of November 2004, the Galville Goat's homepage was hacked into, and one of the two official webcams... Chat just says, Hey honey, you want to burn a goat for our vacation? <laughs> okay. On the, the 27th of December 2004, the Galville Goat's homepage was hacked into, and one of the two official webcams changed. One year, while security guards were posted around the goat in order to, in order to prevent further vandalism, the temperature dropped far below zero. As the guards ducked into a nearby restaurant to escape the cold, the vandal struck. During the weekend of the 3rd to 4th of December 2005, a series of attacks on public Yule goats across Sweden were carried out. The Gavel Goat was burned on the 3rd of December. The Vixby Goat on Gotland was burned down. The Yule Goat in Scorch Pig or Scotland was torched. And there was an attack on a goat in Leistilvale, Vesterbotten. I probably butchered those all. <clears throat> in the, the Christmas season of 2006 marked the 40th anniversary of the Gavel Goat. And on Sunday, on, on the Sunday, the 3rd of December, the city held the largest celebration in honor of the goat. The goat community fireproofed the goat with fiber protractor fireproof fireproofing stuff instead of these airplanes. In earlier years, when the goat had been fireproofed, the dew made the liquid drip off the goat. To prevent this from happening, in 2006, fireproof protector solvent base was applied to the goat. Despite their efforts, the goat has been destroyed a total of 36 times, including the most e recent incident on the 27th of November, 2016, when an arsonist equipped with petrol burned it down just hours after its inauguration. And my chat just goes burn slat. Burn slat. Okay, whatever. <laughs> these people, this isn't just, these are people going out of their way to burn down this goat. Their tenacity is almost admirable. It's been like over 50 years they've been doing this shit. Oh, God. Natural Science Club's Yule Goat. <clears throat> it's for the satisfaction, my chat says. These people have poured their heart and soul into these goats. And they burned them. As funny as it is, this, is a f this, this goat does not deserve it. The goat does not disturb it. Since 1986, there have been two Yule goats built in Gavel. The Gavel Goat by the Southern Merchants and the Yule Goat built, in, built by the Natural Science Club of the School of Vasa. It's tradition, my chat says. <clears throat> the burning. <laughs> Until 1985, the Southern Merchants held the world record for the largest Yule Goat. But over the years, the Natural Science Club goat, cl Club's goat increased in size. And in 1985, their Yule Goat made into the Guinness Book of Records with an official height of 41 feet. And now my chat's just spamming sapnap cults. Oh god. 
The creator of the original 1966 goat, Stig Galvin, thought the Natural Science Club's goat had unfairly won the title of largest Yule goat because the goat was not as attractive as the southern merchant's goat and the neck was excessively long. The next year there was a goat war! Oh no! Oh no, a goat war. <laughs> the southern merchants understood the publicity value and erected a huge goat. The fuck? The Natural Science Club erected a smaller one in protest. The southern merchants had intended that their huge goat, goat would reclaim the world record, but the measurements of the goat showed it fell short. Over the following seven years, there were no further attempts on the world record, but there was some hostility between the Natural Science Club and the southern merchants, evidenced by the fact that the Natural Science Club put up a sign near their goat wishing a Merry Christmas to everyone except the Southern Merchants. <laughs> the fucking petty! I got to applaud! I didn't know the Swedes had an M to be that fucking petty. In, in 1993, the Southern Merchants again announced that they were going to attempt the world record. The goat, the goat stood at 34 feet when completed. The Natural Science Club's Yule Goat that year measured 49 feet, which earned them another place in the Guinness Book of Records. They just flexed. Okay. Now, we are going to see the timeline of how many times this thing has been fucking burnt. Okay. First time, fire. Second time, survived. Third time, survived. Fourth time, fire. In 1970, it was destroyed six hours after it was made. The ghost destruction was blamed on two drunken teenagers. With help from several financial contributors, the financial contributors, the goat was reassembled out of Lake Reed. So, okay, in 1971, it was smashed to pieces. Southern merchants became tired of their goats being burned down and stopped constructing them. The Natural Science Club from the School of Vasa took over and built a miniature goat. In 1972, it collapsed. In 1973, it was stolen. <laughs> These people just fucking picked up and stole a goat. They stole a massive wooden goat. What? Where would you even put it? Oh, no. In 1974, it was... It was fire again. In 1975, it collapsed. In 1976, it was hit by a car. <laughs> I want to know, was it intentional? Or was, was it getting hit by a car intentional? Or was it just some drunk Swede who did, yeah, and just, <laughs> yeah, it got hit by a car in 1976. <laughs> okay. Okay. In 1977, it was fire again. In 1978, it was kicked to pieces. In 1979, it was it was destroyed even before it got it was built. It was destroyed by fire slash broken, and it's oh, and it says the second. No, the first one was destroyed by fire before it was built. The second was broke, was destroyed. They, there were two goats that year, and both were destroyed. Oh, God. Okay, in 1980, it was fire again. In 1981, it survived. Thank fuck. No, there's no way you're gonna... Chat, it wasn't... It wasn't a piñata. It wasn't a piñata. Okay, in 1981, it survived. In 1982, it was fire again. In 1983, they just decided to take out the legs. They broke its kneecaps, apparently, I, from what I can assume. The rest of it was fine. I can tell my... My chat's all Minecraft YouTuber fans, because someone just said, sometimes you have to steal Tubbo. I love Minecraft YouTuber, but sometimes it's not all related to Minecraft YouTuber. God damn it. Okay. So, la yeah, last I checked, 1883, it got its legs destroyed. They destroyed its kneecaps and left it there to die. Oh, that poor fucking goat. Um, 84, it was fire. In 85, it was fire again. 
It, this time, it was enclosed by a two-meter high metal fence, guarded by securities and soldiers from the Gavel Fourth, the Gavel One Fourteenth Infantry Regime. Oh, this was also the year the, that the it was in the Guinness Book of World Records. Okay, eighty-six. It was fire, and the Southern Merchants merchants built their first goat since 1971 it and it was burned from 86 onwards two goats were built each year one by the southern merchants and one by the school of Asa. um in 1887 it was heavily fireproofed and it got burnt down in 88 it was survived gamblers were for the first time able to gamble on the fate of the goat with english bookmarks oh gosh in 89, it was destroyed prior... The first one was... There was two. It was just, first one was destroyed prior to assembly. Financial contributions from the public were raised to rebuild a goat, and the second goat was burned down in January. In March 1990, another goat was built, this time for the shooting of a Swedish motion picture called Blackjack. Huh. Okay. Both times it was fire. <laughs> okay. In 1990, the goat was guarded by many volunteers, and it survived! That is the power of volunteers, everybody. In 1991, it was burned down. <laughs> oh, fuck. The goat was joined by an advertising Ted sled that turned out to be illegally built. It was later rebuilt to be taken to Stockholm as part of a protest campaign against the closing of the first 14th Infantry Regime. <laughs> Oh, in 1992, it was burnt down eight days afterwards. And then the second one was built and burnt down again on the 20th of December. Sometimes you have to gamble tub away. Wait, God damn it, chat. Both the National Science Club and Southern Merchants Goats burnt down on the same night. Oh, no. This was a coordinated attack. The latter was rebuilt and burnt down on December 20th. The perpetrator of the three attacks was caught and sent to jail. The GOAT Committee was founded in 1992. This is the first time hearing of a GOAT Committee. God damn. <sighs> it got to the point where they made a fucking GOAT Committee. Okay. In, in 1993, it was guarded by taxis and the Swedish Home Guard. That's what it says. I... Don't quote me on this. It said it was guarded by taxis. And it's and it survived. In 1994, it survived again. And the GOAT followed the, na the Swedish national hockey team to Italy for the world championship in hockey. That is good. I, I, I'm Hockey is like the one sport I'm genuinely interested in. This one time, it burned down on Christmas Day to fire. A Norwegian was arrested for attempting to burn down the GOAT. It was rebuilt for the 550th anniversary for Galberg County. You know what? I think the problem here is that most of the people g burning the goat down are tourists. Like, the first couple times it probably... was local kids being douchebags. But most of the time since, I think it's probably been tourists. Chat, don't salute the person who was arrested! <laughs> ah! <sighs> okay. Okay, in 1996, it was monitored by webcams and survived. In 1997, it survived with damage. It, it was... They attacked it with fireworks! Oh, God! <laughs> they fireworks the goat! They attacked the goat with fireworks! Ah! Okay, the 11th of December, it was burnt. <laughs> In the 11th of December, it was burnt down with fire during a major blizzard. How the fuck do you burn down a goat during a blizzard? How do you burn down a goat during a blizzard? <laughs> this ghost just cursed! <laughs> it fucking... It burnt down during a blizzard! In 
1996, it was burned down. It was in 1999, it was burned down within hours. Oh, God. Okay, in 2000, it was burned down in late December. In addition to the Southern Merchant's Goat being built, the Natural Science Club's goat was thrown into the river. <laughs> and my chat's bringing up Tubbo in the fireworks again. God damn it. <laughs> in 2000, one of the goats was burnt down, and the other got tossed into the fucking river. Oh, my God. In 2001, a visitor from Cleveland, Ohio, was arrested for burning the goat. The National Science Club was also goat was also burned down. On behalf of America, I can say we do not claim that guy. <sighs> okay, in 2002, it survived. It was on Lucia. The guard the goat was guarded by Swedish radio, radio and TV personality Gert Feikling. I don't. I probably butchered that. A 22 year old from Stockholm tried to set the goat, the Southern Merchant's goat, on fire, the, but failed. The goat receiving only minor injuries. Okay, 2003, burned. 2004, burned. 2005, it was also burned. But this time, it was burnt by unknown vandals reportedly dressed as Santa in the gingerbread man by shooting a flaming arrow at the goat. <gasps> what? <laughs> Reconstructed on the 5th of December, the hunt for the arsonist responsible for the goat burning in 2005 was featured on the weekly Swedish live broadcast, Three TVs Most Wanted, on the 8th of December. And we're gonna have fun. You put on that Santa costume. I'll grab the flame. I'll grab the bow and arrow. We're gonna fucking light it up like Vikings. Oh no. Oh, ho, ho. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. I gotta take a drink. Got my throat. Oh god. <sighs> In tooth. Now the chat is just saying drown Puffy. Oh no. In 2006, the Southern Mer it it survived. It it was it was taken down on the 2nd of January and is now stored in a secret location. That the 2006 goat is like Mr. fucking president. Okay, in 2007, the Natural Science Club's goat was toppled on the 13th and was dismembered. And was and was burned on the twenty fourth. The southern merchant, the southern merchant's goat survived. Okay. In two thousand eight, it was burnt down again. Ten thousand people turned out for the inauguration of one of the goats. No backup goat was rebuilt. To, was was built to replace the main goat. Should the worst happen, nor was the goat treated with flame repellent. Anna Osman, spokesperson of the GOAT committee, said the repellent made it look ugly in, th in the previous years, like a brown terrier. On the 16th of December, the Natural Science Club's GOAT was vandalized and later removed. On the 26th of December, there was an attempt to burn down the Southern Merchant's GOAT, but passerbys managed to extinguish the fire. Pogtopia about Shat Shlat. Let's light up like Vikings. Thank you, chat. Thank you. Uh, an attempt to burn down... The southern merchant's goat, but passerby has managed to extinguish the fire. The following day, the goat finally succumbed to the flames ignited by an unknown assailant at at 3:50 a.m. Oh God! In 2009, it burned down again. A person attempted to set the southern merchant's goat on fire the night of December 7th. An unsuccessful attempt was made to throw the Natural Science Club's goat into the Wheat River the weekend of the 11th of December. What is up with people throwing the Natural Science Club's goat into the river? On the night of the 23rd of December, before 4 o'clock, the Southern Merchant Goat was set on fire and was burned to the frame, even though it had a thick layer of snow on its back. The goat had two online webcams were put out of that were put out of service by a DDoS attack instigated by computer hackers just before the burning. That was fucking calculated. Oh God. Oh, I, I missed a, I, 
I, I missed part. The gr the culprit then tried again without success to set. Okay, so an unsuccessful attempt was made to throw the natural science club's goat into the re river the weekend of the 11th of December. The culprit then tried again without success to set the goat on fire. Someone stole the natural science club's goat using a truck on the night of the tw of the tw of the 14th of December. So eventually, after tra failing to drown it, failing to burn it, they just stole it. Stop saying you're gonna throw Puffy into the river, goddammit, chat. <sighs> okay. In 2010, it survived. On the night of the sec of the second of December, arsonists made an unsuccessful attempt to burn the natural science club's goat. On December 17th, a Swedish news site reported that one of the guards tasked with protecting the southern region's goat had been offered payment to leave his post so that the goat could be stolen via a helicopter and transported to Stockholm. Both goats were defied, were dismantled, and returned to storage in early January 2011. But who the fuck is rich enough to try and steal a goat? WITH A HELICOPTER! WHAT?! Okay. Uh, ignoring the rich goat thieves. 2011. <sighs> Sprayed with water to create a coating of ice, but it burned down. Mild weather resulted in the protective ice melting. The Natural Science Club goat was also burned. 2012. Burned down. 2013, soaked in flame retardant and still fucking burned down. 2014, it survived. At least three arson attempts were made, and the Natural Science Club goat collapsed. Oh, God. 2015, fire. A 26-year-old man fleeing the scene <laughs> with a singed face smelling of gasoline and holding a lighter in his hand was arrested. Under questioning, he admitted to committing the offense, adding that he was drunk at the time and that in respect, in retrospect, it was an extremely bad idea. He was sentenced in January 2018 to probation by an athlete court with a 86,000 Swedish dollar fine. The Natural Science Club goat was also burned. <gasps> okay, 2016, 2016, 2016. Come on, keep it together, keep it together. You're almost done. You cannot die of laughter now. Destroyed by an arsonist equipped with petrol on its inauguration day. This was 2016, it was burned. Just hours after its 50th birthday party, organizers said they would not rebuild the goat this year. The 21 year old was sentenced to probation by Gail Gavel Tresgret and was fined roughly 100,000 Swedish dollars. The evidence mainly revolved around the hat that the pet. Per perpetrator dropped during his escape. The police later DNA matched it with the 21 year old local. It was replaced by the smaller National Science Club goat built by local high school students. The goat. This goat! <laughs> this goat was later hit by a car! Oh fuck, oh fuck. That is the second time I know that that goat has been hit by a fucking car. Ah, 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 ah. Okay. 2017, survived. Double fence, cameras, and guards. The goat was inaugurated on the 3rd of December. No reported attempts to burn the goat were made. Okay. 2018, fencing, cameras, guards, taxi ride to increase... Taxi rank to increase number of police nearby. The goat was inaugurated on the 2nd of December. An attempt of burning the Nat Natural Science Club's goat occurred the night of December 15th, resulting in minor damage to its left front leg. The Glabenbach Twitter account recorded two incidents, an unspecified harassment on the 7th of December and an intrusion into the goat's enclosure on the 31st of December from someone claiming to need to use the toilet. <laughs> they didn't, I don't even think the second guy even did anything. He just wandered in after saying he needed to use the toilet he fu probably fucking lied just to come in and, s and look at the goat like big boy that's a big boy okay 2019 <clears throat> 2019 <clears throat> double fence 24 hour ctv 
Two guards patrol around the GOAT frequently, 24 hours a day, along with the K-9 unit. The GOAT was again inaugurated on the 1st of December. On the 13th of December, fire crews responded to a call that the little GOAT was burning, only to discover it was in fact a miniature Yule GOAT someone had brought and torched at the scene. The Natural Science Club GOAT was burned but not destroyed in the early hours of the 24th 27th of December, a suspect was taken into custody. This is the first time ever that the GOAT survived more than two years in a row. This is the third year it survived, and it survived a fourth year again. 2020! The one good thing about 2020? The GOAT survived! Guards, double fence, 24-hour CTV, public webcam feed. The GOAT was inaugurated on the 29th of November. Due to COVID-19 pandemic, De due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the inauguration was digital. The public had been advised not to gather around the GOAT. There was no traditional celebration. The GOAT was not harmed during the 2020 holiday season, making 2020 the fourth consecutive year of the GOAT survival. And then I see also there's something called baby Jesus theft. What the fuck? Oh, it's just the stealing of the fucking... Okay, it's just the stealing of the little baby Jesus's. Okay. Well, we've been going for an hour, 45 minutes. My chat is still going on about arson and Sapnap. So, I think I'll end it here. My throat's sore. I gotta pee. But I had fun. I gotta ask, do you guys think I should do something like this again? Should I do more weird Wikipedia streams? Because I gotta know. Did you enjoy this? Please tell me if you did, because I really enjoyed this and I want to do more. <laughs> awesome. So, in the meantime, I want you all, I want you all my viewers, I want you all to fuck off and have a great day.